Got it. That's it. All right. By golly, it's wet. And it's time for the weekly vlog and podcast, ladies and gentlemen. For your South Coast Longtime Telescope Club called the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. We call this on screen Monday morning get together on Zoom, the SBAU Astro Hour, where the board chats up new and amazing space news. I'm your moderator, Vice President of the Club, Ron Heron, and proud to be so, up for re election again in a month. In this episode, number 89, for the week of November 7th through the 13th, 2022. It is the seventh day and it is drizzly and wet. Today, before I introduce the rest of the gang, we'll try to tackle all these topics of, well, it's not all cosmology. Part of it is down here on Earth. We're going to address global warming, also known as climate change. And then we're going to go out to the source of the heat from the Parker probe coming down around the sun. Lots of history this week. Hipparchus, the lost astronomy texts have been found. And there's a big election tomorrow, or at least the end of the election midterms, and a lunar eclipse in the middle of the night. Let's meet the gang. Running the show, temporary webmaster, holding two positions, five years, our president, Jerry Wilson. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning. Between your hair, your beard, and your jacket, you're just white all over the place, my friend. Mm -hmm. Married to Pat Henry. <laughs> our incredible outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland, is in front of the... Morning. Ukrainian flag. He's married to our merchandise manager, Pat. And Tom Whittemore is with us. Why Morning. How are Morning. you? Former Westmont College science instructor, editor of the SBAU newsletter. Uh, as long as we're talking about you two guys, uh, you're both there on the night of uh, Westmont's third Friday. Are we doing that this month? Of course. Yes, oh, yes. yes. That's the 18th, Ron. Weather yeah. permitting. Weather permitting. <coughs> We don't mind this kind of weather, I got to tell you. Our president sends out to a bunch of people. Incidentally, I want to thank um, Tessa Flanagan, who we will be seeing and probably hearing a lot more of in the new year 2023 for posting last month's uh, minutes of our outdoor meeting. We're going to have another one, probably one of our last, you suppose, this coming Saturday, gentlemen, at five. Um, weather permitting. Weather yes. <laughs> yeah, and and by the way, uh, she put the time as five thirty, but it's at five. Oh, well, the, five. The it's even, party's at seven. Five. It's even starting to get dark, isn't it? Yeah. What yeah. time is the star party, Chuck? Seven. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we get these silly science cartoons, with, which mostly make us titter and giggle. Um, some, <laughs> of them, some of them retrospective on Halloween. This is from Jerry. And so if you'd like to call one of those up, here we go. Stand by. Start the hour with a little levity. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Here's, here's a funny one. The sun burns out and it goes dark. Well, you have no problem setting up your telescopes with it. What is on the sun? What is, are those two hands or? That's the broken filament in the light bulb. <laughs> oh, it's a filament. Okay. <laughs> That's why you want an LED sun. Yeah. yeah. This is an old generation sun. Yeah. <laughs> and this is at least eight, at least eight minutes ago, because yeah. <laughs> we'd have eight minutes if it actually happened. You know how yeah. that guide to putting your clocks back. I like this one. Um, let's see, a column. Where are we? Got, oh, smartphone, sundial, oven, and <laughs> car radio. We still have car radios, guys. I'm sure they, they, they no longer contain AM access FM <laughs> i know it's all uh, xm and uh, what's the other half of xm uh, serious 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 XM. Yeah, competitor yeah Does it spell the same way as the star i don't think it is yes it? it is it is yeah it's it is yeah scorched i have a feeling the smartphones are getting rid of uh wrist watches big time i just have that feeling because i don't wear one <laughs> Okay, let's go to another one, gentlemen. Well, let's go to the smartphone. You leave it alone because it does its magic automatically. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's amazing, even when you yep. turn it off overnight. Sundial, move one house to the left. <laughs> Oven, you need a master's in electronic engineering or a hammer. And the <laughs> car radio is not worth it. Wait six months. 
<laughs> and microwave, I guess, would be in there with oven. But back in the old days of the sundial, didn't it work differently at different parts of the year? They didn't have a daylight saving time back then, did they? That's right. You had to move it, or you just had to mentally do it. Okay. All right. What do we got here? A bunch of uh, aliens looking at the earth. One of them's yelling out, last month they were lobotomizing pumpkins, for God's sake. Now they're shoving bread up a turkey's ass. This planet has some issues, Bert. Let's get away and go home. Interesting name. Here's a gentleman suddenly wondering about the sound coming out of his uh, instrument. Hey, this is really weird. <laughs> Sudden, my drive motor's making a funny purring noise, and my mouth has picked up a strange vibration. And that could be any one of us probably cutting it. Uh, I think that's directed at Chuck, that one. <laughs> I, I'm the only one that doesn't have a cat, and I'd love to have one right now. Oh, but I love this one. Yeah, we, we don't have one. Oh, wow. Something I've often wondered about. The whole underwater world beneath the oceans never get to witness something we land creatures get to see all the time. Little fish spots, <laughs> the whale on the surface. And my God, look at that. Wow. Oh. <laughs> That's cute. That's good. I wonder who and this was. A, this was a, a, um, a metaphor for exactly how I discovered astronomy. Mm -hmm. my, when I was five years old, my dad was carrying me um, into our front gate and uh, facing him over my over his shoulder. And he leaned down to open the picket fence gate. And when he did, I looked over his shoulder straight up and I can still picture the stars. It just it was so impressive. We were, out, we were rural, and it was just stunning. Sounds yeah. like a cherished memory. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right, here's an alien sucking up in, above the woods. Uh, there it is. Permission denied. Alien spacecraft hovering over the forest sucks up a big burly grizzly bear with this unexpected result. The aliens soon learn the very hairy beings, the earthlings, don't take kindly to strangers or being probed. So good luck with that grizzly gentleman getting rid of him. That's cute. Oh, in the ancient times, they <laughs> did have a version, I guess, of daylight saving time standard. A couple of overworked medieval workers having to move the great rock columns on the ancient Stonehenge time. Either Druid timekeeping. Keeping. Say again? Druid timekeeping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there we go with the sun. I don't need this one again. It's not going to happen. So it's just the four of us mm -hmm. chattering right. around. And uh, I Tim, Tim Crawford I is watching. Oh, it's oh. Tim. All right, Tim. A lot of questions, please. I need to augment that. Normally, I'm the question guy. But real quickly, uh, you want to scan the best outreach stuff, Chuck, that we can look forward to this coming month? Uh, it's a it's a pretty quiet outreach month. Um, we've got, uh, of course, a star party on Saturday, weather permitting. Uh, this Thursday, we're doing Peabody School, and then uh, Friday is this Camp Westmont also, so uh, that's going to be, they're hoping for hundreds of students. I, I don't think it'll be that quite that crowded, but that's uh, that's at Westmont at 5 p.m. for setup, and then, of course, our, our planning meeting and our, our star party, second Saturday of every month, and then Westmont on the third Friday. Well, let me run something by you because I only have one confirmation. It's up to me to program our speaking people on the beginning of the month meeting. And I got the president talking about his home uh, observatory. How about a report from you similar without going into detail on any science subject? What you've been looking at, what's happened lately, maybe an overview of outreach. We count on you for 20 minutes at least. Yeah, um, I've been... I mean, all I've been doing is outreach and asteroid occultations. So, <laughs> then tell us stories. Uh, give us a view of the future and post, you know, pandemic. What's changed? Uh, not much has changed. Uh, I did have the bear visit me one morning, but uh, that was about the only excitement I've had. <laughs> At your house? Yeah. You're wow. kidding? A little black bear? No, it wasn't little. <laughs> no. Uh, a couple of houses down, the neighbor has chickens, and uh, I was setting up about 1 a.m., and I heard a bunch of ruckus from the chickens, <laughs> and I was thinking they were having a bad night, and uh, then were. about a uh, quarter to two, um, I was 
my my hand paddle had died so i was having to adjust my scope manually and i went over to, to move my scope and when i stood up there was this big black bear in the middle of the road wow and he looked nice and healthy you know shiny fur and everything and apparently he had eaten all the chickens in the neighbor's coops he'd broken in and ripped the coop apart and, ate oh them. and uh, <laughs> so i i said shoo get out of here and he took a step toward me and i thought mm, maybe that wasn't such a good idea <laughs> Uh, but then he turned and he went to the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street and just continued up the sidewalk. And I think that was the bear that got killed by the Fairview uh, interchange a couple of days oh. later. Well, unlike the uh, uh, the cats, the, the big cats, if you know what I mean, you know, mountain lions, they're omnivores. They probably love chicken even better than they love blueberries or veggies. Uh, yeah, cats are carnivores. Yeah. Huh? Cats yeah. are carnivores. Bears are omnivores. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I said. Did I say oh, okay. carnivores? I'm sorry. Yeah. And, well, anyway. and, and this there were there were chicken coops being raided all across the foothill areas of Goleta. So I think it was that bear. Although we have reports of another bear up at the end of our street. So we'll see. I won't I wonder if it's legal to have chickens outside the city limits. You live in Nolita, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's legal. There's, there's several neighbors that have chickens. Well, I'm over here inside the city limits, and I went for a walk one morning and heard the rooster in the backyard of somebody's house over here. And I thought that's, I don't think that's allowed, but now they're gone. So I'm sure somebody reported them. Okay, everybody, your wife's okay. Anything to report? Uh, I guess it'll be Saturday that your wife, Pat, a merchandise manager tells us we work out our gifts to the speakers and Rory Bentley was good. Yeah. We were one of his first speeches on Friday night. He did, a, he did a good job. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And he did too. And so far I'm I hope I'm batting a thousand. If I can just get December ready, what? What's You're doing the, very well. What? Well, what? Uh, what's the consensus on opening versus not opening? Why don't we tell everybody right now? It's one of the first Friday uh, Mondays of uh, November for back inside Farron Hall on I think December second. Is that our first Friday? Friday. Yeah. yeah. Of the month, I think it'll be a hybrid is... meeting at, in Farrand Hall. Um, some of it you can check in, tune in by Zoom, just like you would normally. Um, I will be in Farrand Hall. Uh, I'm, it's not clear yet whether a speaker will be there to me. I well, we're the speakers. You're the speaker. oh, yeah. speakers. Yeah. I'm still not sure whether it's me going to be. Oh, no, that's something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, point. So, and uh, the webmaster then will be, thank you. The webmaster then will be, um, coffee just got delivered here. Yeah. The webmaster will be. Um, Tom Todd. Uh, no, no, Chrissy. Uh, Chrissy. Oh, Chrissy. Oh. Yeah. And we're going to transmit as well. We'll be online as well as in the little hall behind uh, Fleischman Auditorium. At right. Yeah, Ferrand. Ferrand Hall. Ferrand Hall. I enjoyed so, so there. Chuck, is there no uh, annual uh, banquet? Will there be a banquet? A uh, uh, Christmas one. party? I, I think we, no, no, I think we, we. That window is closed. Yeah. 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 There's been years since we've had one because of the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. Windows, we'll windows, have closed. Here. windows closed and so are most of the restaurants. <laughs> if you just like a little, uh, what, what I've been doing lately is, um, this is the time of the year that you can say good night to our tourists and say good morning to our tourists. It's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so our tourist is one of my favorite stars. It's, it's, it's a red giant in Boatus, the herdsman. And just after the sun goes down in the Northwest, you can take a look at it. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, Jerry. I'll, I'll stop. It looks like. Oh, uh, no, I didn't mean to stop you. I'm just. Go ahead. Okay. Get, get prepared. It, it, out that you know as our tourist goes underneath us you know uh, as we spin you can actually see it come up because now the uh the nights are long enough to have this happen it, it's really fun watching it come up so it comes up in the northeast it goes down in the northwest uh, just one little quick one uh, what i've been enjoying and I, I like binoculars a lot i use a lot of binoculars just sitting out here if you have a southern horizon nowadays you can see some really interesting constellations, one of which is the, um, the southern fish, uh, Pisces austrinus. And um, in there, if, if you take your binoculars and you point them towards Fomalhaut, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, um, th there's a couple of you really pretty little golden stars that are very easy to pick off uh, with, uh, with binoculars. 
Um, below there, you, you to the right, you get Groose the Crane, which is kind of a neat, a neat looking thing. It was uh, Joe Doyle told me a long, long time ago. It look, looks like a sail. Looks like I a think sail. it looks like a giraffe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's a neat. Depends concept. on what type of sail. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to the left, you'll see Phoenix. Okay, with a bright star called Anka. And to the right, you'll see Indus, the Indian. So there's some neat looking. If you have a southern horizon, there are some wonderful constellations and groupings of stars that binoculars will pull out. So that's that's my spiel. Well, forgive me for uh, not knowing. My ignorance, of course, is a big part of this program. But what constellation is Arcturus in? Boötes, Boötes, the herdsman. Oh, okay. So he's basically herding the two bears, or and, I guess maybe the dogs too, huh, Chuck? Yeah. Using the dogs, using the dogs to herd the bears. Yeah. And it's a red giant like Betelgeuse, but not ready no. to blow. No, no, no. Oh, Betelgeuse no, no, is a red supergiant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. supergiant is it's different. It's a very, very, very pretty star, and it's prominent as it comes up in the morning. And I'm actually seeing the star that comes up just ahead of that, and I believe it's called Mufried, uh, right, right ahead of Arcturus. So Ar Arcturus um, is part of a constellation that Chuck always says looks like like a kite or, or an, an ice cream, cream cone. <laughs> oh, an ice cream cone. And, but he kind of comes up on his side. And so there are other stars that come up with Arcturus. It's a very, very, very pretty star. And my first star story that I put together in the, uh, the newsletter some months ago featured Arcturus. Was, uh, if you ever want to go back and archive that, I wrote a little story on Arcturus. Well, when you zero in on those with your telescopes, your red giants and super red giants, do they look red? Oh, the yeah. orangey. Every yeah, time. orange, orange, uh huh. Orange and red. Okay. Shall we the go? The dimmer they are, the redder they look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's red uh, dwarfs. Mm -hmm. They're totally different. That's, just, animals, that's right? just surface temperature, Ron. So, right. Surface so. temperature makes them red. Okay. Anyway, anyway, just we should break away. Yeah, Jerry had some phenomenal notes on global uh, warming, uh, aka warming. climate change. You want to radiometry? This is what it's called. The study of this. Radiometry is the field. It's a field I would I worked in during my active career, and uh, it's basically the metrics of radiation. Mm -hmm. So it's quantitative radiation measurements, and that's that's light from the sun and light from the earth. This shows, this shows the global mean surface temperature from the start of the, actually, well, after the start of the industrial age in 1880 to present, um, the industrial age is considered to have started in 1750. Chart doesn't go back that far, but this shows the temperature of the earth, the mean temperature of the earth um, every year, every inflection point in it, say there, 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 those are different years of measurement of it. It fluctuates, it has noise on it. We'll see why it has noise in a bit. And then this is a five year running average of those things, which smooths out the data. So and I think they noise. took, Jerry, it just, uh, it's not shown on the graph, but I think the zero point was taken as like 1950 or something like that. Um, for the temperature anomaly? Yeah, for the temperature anomaly. So that's your y-axis? Um, yeah. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, zero is at uh, 1950, right in there. Okay. So Before that, right. we were uh, four-tenths of a degree below at this time, and now we're about half a degree above, and the worry is that we're heading four, five degrees above, yeah. but we're hoping to contain it to two and a half degrees above. And so far, we're sort of on track to head toward the two and a half degrees. That will have severe consequences too, but it's much less than the catastrophic values of five degrees. Mm -hmm. wow. So, These and we're not gonna, get, not gonna get that much into what the consequences of it is. We're just gonna do the science of it. And so this shows um, what comes in. This is the Gazenta. It's the solar radiation comes from the sun. The, uh, this curve here, the yellow, is the actual sun, sun radiation that we measure outside the atmosphere. Um, this curve here is the 
5,250 degrees C black body radiation curve from uh, Planck's radiation law. And you see the sun pretty much fits that very accurately. Not so much up here. There's some extra um, emissions up here that um, are accounted for with a different mechanism. But we can speak about the radiation going from the sun to the earth or from the earth out to space, both as Planck radiation curves, which makes it a nice, easy thing to quantify. The, um, this is the red is what gets to the earth to heat it up. And this is what comes through the atmosphere. So the difference between Planck's curve um, and the red curve, this is energy that is lost because it doesn't transmit through the atmosphere. And you see oxygen is a big absorber here. Ozone is a big absorber um, out in the ultraviolet. This is the visible spectrum here from, these are in nanometers. So for those like me that were calibrated in angstroms, this is 5,000 angstroms or 500 nanometers mm -hmm. and, or micro, yeah. So, um, and this is half of a micron of spectral range. So the visible is from here to here. Mm -hmm. Silicon cuts off around this range out here. And so this region here is called the near IR. And this is the visible. You can see that the bulk of radiation from the sun comes to the earth as visible radiation. It peaks in the green. And by no coincidence, our eyes are most sensitive to green. Mm -hmm. We clearly are products of this planet's environment. This is, uh, there's a lot of water bands here. Here is a short wavelength water band. Here is a mid wavelength water band then uh, you start seeing CO2 involvement here. Now nothing, this is um, two and a half microns out, which is still short wavelength IR. It goes, the, the radiation curve goes much farther out than that. And this is, we'll get to that farther out part in a minute, but this is a global energy balance. What this shows, what this talks about is that the difference between what comes in and what goes out is the energy that's available to heat the earth. So these are the various methods. This is the radiation from the sun. It bounces off the surface in some cases better than others, like ice, ice, um, ice sheets reflect a lot of this back. Clouds reflect a lot of this back in this outside. And the cloud variation from year to year is largely the fluctuations you saw in that first plot. The cloud cover is different. It fluctuates all the time. There is radiation absorbed by the atmosphere, but what gets absorbed by the surface is what gives us our ultimate balance here. The um, um, Going back out, we have surface radiation. Now the sun, sun is a 5,800 degree Kelvin, not Celsius, Kelvin degree black body, back like that. And it heats the earth to about 300 degrees Kelvin. And a 300 degree Kelvin has its peak emission at 11 microns, way out of the visible band, way out in the infrared. And the infrared at that region is heavily dependent on the atmosphere to get out. So if you have a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, then you're gonna get not only reflection of the heat back down, which never gets out, but you're going to have a very limited degree of heat getting out. So the balance is what we live with <clears throat> in terms of heating the surface. If you shut down this exit route, or if you shut down this entrance route, but we don't know how to do that. But we do know what's causing the e exit route to uh, shut down. And that's the point of the whole science of global warming. Mm. So uh, this Jerry, just, just one thing. Uh, Tim Crawford said he was going to have a couple of questions that he's going to enter in chat, and I, that's YouTube chat, and I think you're the only one that can see that. Oh, really? That's too bad, because I don't know how to get at it. Oh, okay. See, so, well, if when he enters it, have him tell you when he's entered it, and I'll see if there's an extra flag here. Or I can just ask him to text it to me. Yes, that would be good. There you go. That's so weird. this is a plot that I generated for the Planck's radiation curve. 
or a 5,810 degree Kelvin sun, which is the best fit we use the Raytheon and Hughes for the sun. And it goes down like this. Now this is wavelength in the visible. You can see it's peaked here in the visible. And that's a tremendous amount of radiation that comes in because this is a log curve. And this is a 300 degree K radiation curve that peaks around 10 microns, way in the infrared, the long wave infrared. And the Earth is now an emitter at this. So this is what needs to get out because it's generated by the Earth's surface temperature. So that needs to get out. The, um, this is the uh, absorption coefficient <clears throat> in the, the wavelength. Oh, wavelength is up here. And it goes the other way now because they use, um, it's one of these irritating um, science disciplines that uses wave number instead of wavelength. So this is wavelength in microns. So this is um, 3.5 microns, short wavelength, mid wavelength, and long wavelength out here. This is about 10 microns. This is where the earth is trying to pump out its radiation. And you can see from the curves here that there is a transmission loss at this range out here that is the transmission ability of the um, atmosphere goes down, the absorption coefficient goes up. Um, let me see if I got that right. I, I should have summarized the caption so I didn't have to read the whole thing again. But the um, uh, carbon dioxide red curve is, um, its absorption coefficient is going away. This is the water in the atmosphere. Water will let it out at this 10 microns. The CO2 has a high absorption coefficient here and little shoulders in here. So it's not going to be very nice to letting this 11 micron radiation get out. And that's due to the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. Uh, Jerry? Yeah. Um, Tim, Tim texted a question. He, he, he wants to know uh, what black body radiation is. So I think you're gonna have to go through the whole Planck equation and stuff. I didn't want to put an equation up because, um, but I'll talk it through. Okay. The, um, uh, when I was writing a book at one time, a report, and it was for public release, I was told that every time, for every equation I showed in the book, I, I would lose 50% of my audience. <laughs> so um, I decided not to put that in here. But what it is, is the way matter and energy and light interact with each other is through uh, electrical uh, dipole oscillations. A dipole is like having two golf balls connected by a spring. And if you pull them apart and let them go, they, they oscillate back and forth. And the amplitude of that um, oscillation squared is what's called the oscillator strength. And it's the oscillator strength that tells you how many photons that thing, the combination is gonna emit. If one golf ball is charged positive and the other golf ball is charged negative, then you get um, a, an oscillating electric dipole. And these oscillating electric dipoles in the sun, it's a plasma. So you don't have really atoms, you don't have atomic levels that are being oscillated. You have just these random connections, momentary connections between nuclei and electrons and they oscillate at every possible frequency in every possible way. And so you get a uniform distribution of the energy output based on um, how you populate this, those uh, different states. <clears throat> so objects that are completely, totally, and when it's cold, if it's completely, totally black, that's a black body and it absorbs like a black body. At every wavelength, it absorbs. And when you heat that up at every wavelength, it will emit. It'll be a 100% emitter. So does that help, Betty? Yeah, and I, and I think basically also, you know, depending on the temperature, the peak of this curve, which is that black line in this uh, image, moves more toward the higher energy wavelengths. So the lower, the, right. the um, yeah. smaller wavelength, the, um, the, um, toward yeah. the left of the curb here, toward the right. more um, energetic yeah. wavelengths. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's also true that this curve at every wavelength raises. So right. 
when they all raise, this peak moves this way at higher temperatures, and at every wavelength, it goes up a little bit. Yes, that's right. So um, I could do a longer talk, but we'd get into the math more. I, I think that's good. He said thanks. OK, sure. Now, this is the radiative flux from the Earth that um, emitted the space at the top of the atmosphere. And you can see that the at this wavelength, here we are, the wave number down. Here we are at the wavelength, 10 microns. You're not getting a lot out. At longer wavelengths, you're not getting a lot out. It's, it's not emitting. This is stuff that is held back in the atmosphere. So. And so you can see it's CO2, H2O, um, and ozone, ozone. Are, yeah. are greenhouse gases because they're holding that, that heat in. Yes. There's, there's CO2 in here, too. <clears throat> it's just they didn't write that, that caption there. Now, this, um, the radiometry and all this stuff are a lot of papers I published at IRIS, the in, uh, Infrared Imaging System Conferences, which are classified con conferences that you have to have a secret level clearance to get into the present. But this, but they also have outside of the conference, they always have a vendor's display table, and that's open to the public. And so this is a picture of a company selling um, the, uh, um, selling a picture or selling a system that takes pictures, very high resolution pictures in this case, at 11 microns at the long wavelength infrared, 10, 11, 12 microns. And you can see that people are, our body temperature is roughly 300 degrees Kelvin. And you can see that we glow by this at this temperature. This is the radiation that we emit. And if you want to verify yourself that it's true that, that this is just a scientific fake, you can take your hand and put it up close to your cheek, not touching Baron, but chuck close. And uh, you can feel the heat from your uh, cheek on your hand. And you can yeah. feel the heat from your hand on your cheek. So yeah, Jerry, just I just want to mention one thing. So when I was at Lockheed Research Labs, I also, you know, worked in this world too, like you did. Mm -hmm. And one of the demonstrations we always like to show people was somebody drinking a hot coffee. <laughs> and watching, oh, yeah. watching how the glow went down, you know, mm -hmm. the esophagus. It's always fun. And their yeah. lips change from black to white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that they, was always fun. Are they selling uh, night goggles? This is not a night goggle technology. This is this could be a night vision thing um, at long yeah. wavelength. It's more of an instrument and a weapons type of thing or a surveillance right. thing. That, that's kind of where we were tuned to, Jerry. And we worked in the world of NSPE and Mercad Telluride, and I bet you did too. Right, yes, mostly Mercad Telluride. It's the best stuff for this, highest yeah. performance, but hardest to grow. The um, yeah. night goggles are taking visible light and amplifying it. And you usually get these green images and look at it and stuff. That's the usual night vision scope. Those are expensive, but they're not nearly expensive as these IR cameras are. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. just an aside, we had a fellow from FLIR show up at one of the mm -hmm. school science nights. Uh -huh. And he had some some uh, infrared an infrared camera and uh, basically it was so sensitive that if, if somebody walked on the blacktop of the playground uh, yeah. for a couple of seconds after they walked by, you could see the heat that their footprints had let, you know, their yeah, footprints right. on the blacktop from the change in heat. Right. And we used to show people the shadow of a large truck, you know, it'd be nice and cool as compared to the side of the truck. Yeah. And of course yeah. this technology is all over the web, isn't it? Web telescope. Yes, this is, the, this is one of the wavelengths that the web operates at. Web also operates beyond this, well beyond this. This image is taken by a camera that has to be cooled below that of liquid nitrogen. Yes. <coughs> uh, at least for this one, at liquid nitrogen, 77 degrees Kelvin. The uh, James Webb has to be treated, has to be cooled well below that by liquid helium. Yeah. Helium boils at 4.2 Kelvin. And they're probably about nine Kelvin or 10 Kelvin um, operating there in space. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. So anyway, that's what that gives you a feel of what what the um, world looks like to light trying to get out of the of the planet. And the um, at that wavelength, the atmosphere is not that transparent. But the real villain here is the element carbon, isn't it? The, is the element, it's CO2 primarily and methane. Methane, if you say it. I've been to a couple of talks. Well, what, what, what is ozone? Ozone is O3. O3. Okay, but there's a layer up there. Remember years ago, right. they had the warnings about the ozone layer? Over and, that's the, and, it, and we like that layer because it right. absorbs ultraviolet and it keeps you from right. getting skin cancer. Right, right. It's a protective, a protective layer, uh, Ron. So it's 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 thick everywhere except Antarctica, or at least it, Antarctica. It was uh, over over Australia and stuff. You can see that the sun's radiation um, turns off here a little bit mm -hmm. at the uh, very short ultraviolet, but the stuff that gets through this is critical. The stuff that gets through is blocked right there and right. In this region, these are molecules that are essential for life on Earth, on the land, and our ozone layer blocks that. And life would not be possible on the land on Earth if this little um, red were to extend out to here, mm -hmm. taking everything the sun offered. So our ozone layer is essential for life on Earth. Those wavelengths uh, interact strongly with um, DNA molecule uh, links. And so right. the the ultraviolet, those energetic radiation waves break up DNA. So that's that's why you wouldn't be out on the surface if we didn't have that ozone layer. Right. Now this shows this shows the atmospheric carbon dioxide parts per million and methane. Now methane is a more a stronger absorber. These are um, parts per billion parts per million, parts per billion. So this is lower. There's much more CO2 involved than nothing. So this is um, the trend from 1750, the start of the uh, Industrial Revolution, up to now. And the CO2 is rising exactly corresponding to the temperature, average temperature rise. The uh, methane is going up, and it is leveling off a little bit. Methane does not last well in the atmosphere. It turns, it's a more, it's more absorptive than CO2, but it also uh, breaks down in, in the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's, it's not permanent. Once you release it into the atmosphere, it lasts six months or a year, I think is the number. Um, but CO2 is permanent until it gets sequestered or somehow taken out of the atmosphere by growing trees or by some technology that we're hoping to develop to suck it back out. But, but for the uh, deniers of around the world of uh, climate change, does science know if it's ever changed this fast, this radically and rapidly in the past? Well, Isn't it a, usually that is a very good, very good point. The Earth, the Earth has been much hotter than this. It was molten lava once. It's been much colder than this. Uh, there was the geologic age, which was called snowball earth, where we were solid ice on the surface, a mile thick. Um, but it has never changed this fast. And the fear is that, let me just make one point. The fear is that if we're changing fast, our animals and plant life need multiple generations to keep up with it, to adapt. Now, the higher up you are the food chain, the longer your reproduction cycle is. And but things like viruses and bacteria that reproduce a lot, they're going to be pretty safe. It's things at the top of the food chain that are going to be at risk, like cows and people and you know banana trees and things like that. And there have been times in the past when it's risen very rapidly, but they're all associated with mass extinction. So it's not yeah. like you can say, well, everything will be fine. We lived through it before. <laughs> yeah. Well, te technically, every time there's a new COVID variant, does that mean it's a new species of that yep. on the planet? You know, or a subspecies, you could call it. Yeah. But, but viruses sort of are so different. And the whole virus population doesn't all of a sudden say, OK, everybody become Omicron C. You know, it's just one guy. And then he reproduces. And it reproduces faster and it takes over because it's more adaptive. 
Well, I've heard that the new RSV uh, variant does affect adults, but for some reason it's wiping out the kids. Have you noticed that? Well, it's RSV is um, is more serious in children who are developing their immune systems and in older people whose immune systems are going away. So that's right. why. The primary difference between adults and infants in RVS is that infants do not have a fully developed uh, lung muscular system. They're not able to cough effectively to clear their lungs and air passageways. It's got a respirator. Plus all the kids were the last to get the uh, vaccination. Yeah. Weren't they? Adults just cough their guts out and then they're over it. Wow. Okay. Well, good news. Any, <laughs> any, soul, any global warming questions left? Not from Tim, no. Okay. Well, are we headed toward being Venus? I don't know. Yes, we are. Just uh, ask again. You know, we could, uh, it's next in your talking list, Jerry, uh, and it's uh, the other end of the problem, and that would be the Parker probe, which is has nothing to really do to with what's happening here on Earth, but it is giving us a clearer picture of the sun, right? Coming in. Right. Our that's correct. Okay. And that's the topic coming up. Okay. Okay. This from the current issue, these are pictures taken from the current issue of Physics Today, the November issue. It was a Professor Parker, apparently. Yeah. All right. Lots of illustrations on this one. Get ready. Mm -hmm. Solar So fire. this is a 10 solar radii distance between the sun and this little hot dog here, which is the Parker probe blown up. This is not an actual picture from space of, of the Parker probe from Earth. It might be from a spacecraft. I don't know. It looks like it's shaded, at least to mimic what it looks like. So what this is, um, it's showing us very close to the surface of the sun, much closer than the Earth. We only sample from 93 million miles away, but this is getting much closer. So um, what is the sun's rate? Sun's diameter is 800,000 miles. So this is 8 million miles out there. So within, within the orbit of Mercury. Yes. Well, well, maybe half that because it's the radius. Right. Oh, oh that's right. Yes. Good point. Yeah, I think the diameter is 1.5 million kilometers. Does that sound about right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's in an extreme elliptical orbit. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You'll see the orbits in a short while here. Okay. So it's looking at the coronal structures that are, um, and this looks strangely like the sun did, which makes me think this is a, uh, a Photoshop photo, but. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this looks like the eclipse in 2017, which had mm -hmm. this unique um, coronal shape of one spike down here and then two spikes up there. And somewhere down here, we break the star Regulus on that eclipse. I happen to have a picture of that over my, my desktop here. Anyway, um, it shows that a lot of these, these streamers and stuff go out, they have a lot of internal structure in them. Um, so it says that the upward and downward motion of the coronal features, however, is only apparent. Probably because of the motion of the spacecraft. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. I know that, that, um, space or, um, solar coronas are very tricky in that you can, because I have a solar telescope as a lot of the club members do, uh, 80 millimeter lunt. And you can see the corona, the corona, the what are they called? Filaments on the limb of the sun. Um, I'm having a senior moment here. Prominences. And you can, if, if you look at those in real close thing, which you can't do with that small scope, but when they're photographed real close up, you can see the loop of um, the, the prominence rising like this. But inside the prominence, you can see that the material is flowing down, is flowing back toward the surface of the sun. And what's happening there is that the, the uh, magnetic field that is rising is cooling the very hot atmosphere, and the cooler material then falls back down to the sun. So the magnetic field is rising, and as it reaches up there, it cools material and it drops it down. Um, going from random to oriented is cooling losing heat. So this shows 
um, this is as it went through in its orbit and the distance from the sun is put down here as distance and time at, at the in terms of solar radii. So it's expected that the shape of this curve would be an envelope that is shaped like this. But in fact, there's all these fluctuations. <clears throat> and these fluctuations are things that are like this in the stream, in the prominent stream. Hmm. So, and, and somehow it analyzes all this through that shield? Um, no, it, it looks around the shield. It does? Yeah. Hmm. It has a probe that is resistant to the, uh, the high incidence of flux, which is not that hard to make unless something melts. But the guts of it, the, radio, the, uh, the computer and the radio stuff, that has to be protected from the particular radiation because uh, heat too, but primarily particulate radiation from the sun, because that stuff produces charge in the materials, particularly in insulating layers. And every capacitor and transistor and stuff has uh, insulating layers on it that if they pick up charge, they no longer insulate. They start becoming conductors. And so you're your semiconductor electronics starts failing. Semiconductor electronics are very susceptible to radiation. When the Chernobyl um, thing burned up, the reactor burned up, they'd send in robots, electronic robots, and they used them for a few days until they had burned out their electronics enough that they no longer worked. Then they had to put another one in. So that's back and forth on that right picture that it goes out, goes back in, yes. like a this, almost like a variable star and <laughs> fluctuating. It is the um, as it goes around. It's these are the these are magnetic field lines made, being made visible by the plasma that they're effectively interacting with as they go through. They bend it and clump it up. These are and the magnetic field lines are the vector sum of components from all sorts of activity in the sun. As you get farther and farther away from this, they become all much, they become much more radial. But the Parker probe is looking at them before they com become completely radial. Now this picture shows the sun <coughs> and it shows um, the Parker probe orbit. So this is orbits one through three are going around, going this way. And I don't know where it splits off here to go to three, but you see that they get progressively closer to the sun on orbits one, three, four, five, and orbit six. But they go out here, they go quite a ways out. This one uh, passed through the Gemini meteors. This is the tail, the orbit for our Gemini meteor shower. Here we are at uh, 0.1 AU. The sun, of course, is at zero AU. And this is out at 0.8 AU, which is about where um, another two lines out. This is 0.6. So each of these is not an even number of AUs. Right. So um, here. Well, it's see, just, yeah. Anyway, the Earth is the Earth's orbit we've got about here. It doesn't come quite all the way from Earth, but this is what came from Earth. Here it shows, one of these shows Venus, I think, in it somewhere. Gemini. Anyway, it made several passes of Venus. Yeah. Um, I mean, it looks, Jerry, like each of those little uh, uh, distance measurements are a 0.1 AU apart, doesn't it? Yeah, just the labels are poorly placed. Yeah, the, the, the labels kind of got place kind oh, of I see. Yeah, the, yeah yeah and so of course we're, at, be, we're out at yeah. one au the earth's out at one au yeah yeah, yeah there's that one mm -hmm. oh you so call here we have the meteor stream that's shown over there mm -hmm. it measures meteoroids um, which is what a meteor is before it leaves space mm -hmm. um, and how many collisions it gets and it passes through this 
what's called the beta stream and measures dust this close to the sun also. And that is shown in this picture. Oh, this is one that shows Venus. Here's Mercury yeah. here. Yeah. Here's, here's Venus and the Earth is seen here, not passed by. It shows the Milky Way and it shows um, mm -hmm. the dust measurements and then this are the uh, solar dust that's measured here by the Parker Solar Probe. Now this is made by the Whisper sensor. What? Whisper, W-I-S-P-R. Oh, <laughs> I think that was, um, it may be just defined in the text, but it might be in here. Well, can you explain on the right side picture what the little round circle orbit is around the sun? It comes in from the upper right, goes out at the bottom, but is that to Parker? Uh, yeah. Goes right around the sun and then goes into another elliptical orbit? No, no that's, just, that's just another distance marker, I think, there. Yeah. Okay. And, and they call that... Uh, that leftover dust from the comet, they call it the circumsolar dust shield? Well, these are, are um, these, these lines here are not the Parker's path. These are the beta meteoroids. They're unbound hyperbolic for the green. Oh, and for the, the, the uh, purple too, because they don't come back. Um, so this is dust that comes in as meteoroids uh, collides with um, itself. Well, no, I think the Parker probe is is this unit here, and it's rotating to take looks at the sun. And uh, but this is the geometry that it's flying through, and uh, constructed by the data they're getting from the Parker probe. <laughs> hmm. And and some of this dust here, like when they're talking about the Geminid. Uh, remnants. That's from something that's more like an asteroid than like a comet. It's a, it's a, a burned out comet. It's basically rock now. Right, right. So the beta meteoroids, the unbound ones, uh, and a potential dust stream known as the beta stream. The gray fan-like feature, that is this beta stream here, is a new dust stream produced by interaction between the Gemini meteor trail and the zodiacal dust cloud. Do you suppose we didn't know this before Parker was sent? Um, many of these models were uh, hypothesized. They've never been observed before. They've been observed. This is this is the first observation of them. So it's going to fill in details. What what's the they, they, did, they did project what the envelope would look like, but they didn't project all, all this stuff in there. Do you know how it's going to terminate? Is it going to plunge into the sun? Yes, it will be. It will be when its mission is done. It will be dropped into the sun, and then we'll have the rest of the stuff as it vaporizes, beamed back to us in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This I don't understand totally. It looks like we're looking at the surface of something, or is that the sky inside those? This, this sky. is the sun, um, but not to scale. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Whisper sensor collected images during the extended campaign, fourth perihelion on the sun, not to scale, and masked by the spacecraft's heat shield. So you're looking at the uh, a sun put in there. And this, these are the dust clouds in the plane of the dust that we saw illustrated on this one. See, here we're looking straight down on the sun while everything's playing out in this two-dimensional plane. And here we've got our eyes in the two-dimensional plane and we're seeing obviously the ecliptic because we're seeing um, the planets here and we're seeing the Milky Way pass across it at its 60 degree angle that it makes with the galaxy. And that, <laughs> that plane of dust is what gives you the zodiacal light that you see at sunset and sunrise mm -hmm. uh, around right. the uh, right. um, equinoxes. Well, that dust uh, trail is moving. It's in an orbit, uh, even though they're little pebbles or sand yep. 
size, they're still orbiting, right? Every little individual particle is moving in its own orbit. Now, some of the, depending on the size of the particle, it's also being um, accelerated by sunlight hitting it and things like that. Wow. Now, this is one of these meteoroid trails um, interacting with the zodiacal dust. Oh. Then it bounced off as a beta trail. <laughs> so that's two di different things. The, the dust trail and the zodiac light, they're similar, but not exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. They did, do they know when it's going to die? How many years we get of the probe? They do, but I don't. I'm sure I could look it up. It's got a projected life mission. You know how strict NASA is on these um, um, projected lifetimes of these systems. Um, rovers were each given a 90-day lifespan, and I think they're uh, running over two years each now, so they may extend it. Uh, you got all this stuff out of uh, the November issue of Physics Today, Jerry? Yeah. Is Except that this one. This is a picture of the sun that was taken on um, October 26th uh, from Earth, and it's just there because it's a cute picture, shows a face on the sun. Yeah. Yeah. It's a happy face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, was, I thought maybe it was one of your cartoons that got missed. Well, it could be a cartoon, but it's an actual photograph. Also, when the, um, those meteors hit Jupiter in 94, mm -hmm. if you, there were infrared pictures taken of them. And if you put one of those pictures of the bands of Jupiter, if you took one of those pictures and turned it upside down, it looked just like Oscar the Grouch. So, <laughs> a photograph that went around at work. Well, that's your assignment, Jerry. You got to find that picture and turn it upside down for us. Right. Future. Looks like we're going to have to wait a little weeks ahead to talk about astronomer Hipparchus, ancient Greek. Okay, and we'll then, go. We'll skip past that. Yeah. All right. So the, that was a fabulous story too, Jerry. Yeah. So I hope we can revisit it. Yeah, I'll put it in for next week. All right. Okay, November eighth. Why? That's tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> in honor of one the midterm, morning, right, Chuck? About one in the morning here. It starts uh, for the penumbral <laughs> phases. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Uh, the total. Totality starts uh, around 216, or here it says 217, okay? Okay. And then it ends at 341. Okay. And it's only going to be red? It's not going to be fully covered? Or how does that work? The shadows? Oh, oh, full on. Full on. <laughs> well, what happened to the, whenever it disappeared? Wasn't that in the past? Aren't they, isn't it well, supposed to go the, black? Ron, Ron, the amount of red or black you get depends on how much stuff is in the Earth's atmosphere right. messing with the light and also how deep the moon goes into the umbra. So this right. looks like a very deep umbral eclipse, assuming they've made the diagram match the actual transit. Uh, this is from Chabot Science Center, which I think is up in San Francisco. Yeah, so... Hopefully they've made it accurately. So if it's a very deep umbral eclipse like this would be, you don't get as much red. Okay. But there are such things as partial eclipses where only part of the Earth's shadow goes across. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which leaves you with a The moon can pass through here. Right. And never has the umbra, or it can just briefly touch the umbra. This one's going to go dead center. Now these were, well, before the era of science, um, and the movement, when they had a blood moon, they thought that portended war. Since they were always having wars, they just picked okay. which war it was that they were pretending. At it. And one of our stalwart supporters happens to be president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society, Bruce Murdoch, uh, is not with us because uh, he is downtown at, where is it, Arlington with a group of terrorists. Yeah. Had given, being given a big organ show, they brought it up out of the, the stage. And he says he's going to be out in the morning, assuming we have no cloud cover or rain or whatever's happening right now, taking a picture of this. Maybe he'll show it to us next week. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get any pictures. No, I don't think so. Unless he has a really good um, drone. Yeah. Well, I guess we got a meeting on Saturday and uh, we got uh, a big change coming up in a month. 
December 2nd will either be uh, live or uh, not live or both. I guess that's, that's called hybrid, right? When we're broadcasting to the folks that can't see us. We'll be like right. the undead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to wear masks? We're going to talk about this, I guess, on Saturday, don't we? If it's, it's crowded in the room, that. a mask would probably be a good idea, but yeah, I don't yeah. think it's going to be crowded. Not required. If our beloved uh, treasurer is listening, Colin Powell, maybe you can get rid of the secretary label because it looks like we're getting a good one. Boy, she just posted the minutes. Yeah. First yep. time on our email addresses. Gentlemen, take it easy. Good luck. I'm sure you all voted. And uh, keep it electrical if you can afford it on the road. And <laughs> Tom, keep baking, baking bread, all right? Okay, you let you. We'll see all you right. first of all Saturday night. Tom, why don't you surprise us and come to the meeting or come to the star party at least Saturday if you're not doing anything. Bring Maureen 